You're listening to the My Simplified Life podcast, and this is episode number 64. Welcome to the My Simplified Life podcast, a place where you will learn that your past and even your present don't define your future. Regardless of what stage of life you're in, I want you to feel inspired and encouraged to pursue your dreams, simplify your life, and start taking action today. I'm your host, Michelle Glogovac, and I'm excited to share my stories and life lessons with you while taking you on my own journey. This is my simplified life. Hey friends, welcome back to another episode. I'm your host, Michelle Glugovac. If there's a term we are hearing more and more of, it's self-care. And the truth is that that term varies depending on who you ask. What exactly is self-care and how do you practice it? Business coach and self-care guru and author Rachel Letham is helping women around the world discover what self-care means to them and how they can implement more self-care even if they don't think there's enough time in the day. I read Rachel's most recent book, Self-Care for the Seasons, and was pleasantly surprised to find that this year I've implemented quite a few of the tips she offers simply on my own. You see, friends, self-care looks different for everyone and also looks different in the seasons of your life. I'm so excited to introduce you to Rachel and for you to hear her career story because it even surprised me to hear about the twists and turns her journey has taken her in order to land where she is. Grab your favorite warm drink and settle in for some self-care talk with Rachel and I. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Michelle. I am so excited to talk to you because I think everybody needs to hear from you, especially right now. Would you take a moment to introduce yourself, please? Sure. So I am a business success coach based in the UK, um, but I have a global audience and I focus on positive mindset, but also self-care. So I am also a self-care coach and now a self-care author, and I'm all about bringing well-being into your day-to-day life as much as possible. And you weren't always in this career like so many of us. I think every guest that's been on the show has had a career switch. Can you share a bit about what you did before and how you took those pivots and, and changes to become what you are today? Sure. Well, I used to be known as the queen of the side hustle, so that might give you a little bit of insight <laughs> into my life. But I don't know whether you remember this advert in the sort of 80s and 90s. Did you remember the advert, The Man from Del Monte? Uh, Not off the top of my head, no. (laughs) Well, I I need to stop using that reference because no one remembers it. But basically, it (laughs) it was an advert for Del Monte pineapples, I think, at the time. And he was a man in a Panama hat and he used to travel around the world. And basically, he would say yes to fruit. So the, the tagline was, The Man from Del Monte, he says yes. That does sound familiar. Yeah. Yes. I can picture it in my head. Yes. (laughs) So basically for a large like proportion of my corporate career, that was me, not the man, but (laughs) I used to travel around the world sourcing new um, growers of berries to supply to UK supermarkets, which um, was really exciting and really different. (laughs) That is very different. There's so many jobs out there. I keep telling my adult stepkids, like, you have no idea what you can do. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I think it's, that's why I love sharing this story because it is just so different. Like when I was at university, that is not what I thought I would be doing for a living at all. So yeah, I worked in the fresh produce industry for 13 years and I was, yeah, head of imports for a long period of time. I used to travel to Central and South America and Asia and had a really, um, you know, wonderful time doing that, but it wasn't all glitz and glamour and it was quite stressful. Um, and yeah, while I was in the fresh produce industry, I worked through various different roles. So I was head of supply chain, then head of operations. Um, I ran a strawberry farm for two years. That's a bit random. Um, I set up a bit. You like your berries. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm all about the berries. Very healthy. At least, you know, it was a healthy uh, position to be in. And yeah, I set up a business in Spain for the same company. And then I had a bit of a switch, actually. So whilst I was doing all of this, because I had so much time on my hands, even though I worked an 80-hour week, 
We'll come to that and we'll come to the corporate burnout part. But I decided I didn't have enough on my plate. And my boyfriend at the time moved to China for eight months. So I had a bit more sort of spare time. So I started a um, blog, which was back in 2009. And that's when blogging had just started to become popular. And I'd always written when I was younger. So I was really interested in writing and like blogging was like the thing to do. So I I thought, right, I'm going to do that. Then I was like, well, what do I write about? And so I decided the fresh produce industry is very male dominated. Um, It's a lot better now, but it's still a little bit like that. And I basically decided to wear a dress to work every day for a week, take photos and write about it on the blog. And basically it turned into an online fashion and lifestyle magazine, which I ran um, for seven years alongside the day job. So that's where the side hustle started to come. Wow. Yeah, just all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, and I mean that in a good way. Like, I, I wouldn't have thought you went, oh, I decided to blog about, you know, fashion from mm. berries. I love it. You're very versatile. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, two very different things, but I just loved it. I really, really enjoyed it. So I would like, I, I was fortunate. I had a boss who kind of uh, liked the side hustle kind of aspect because it did give you a little bit of balance. So I was allowed time off. I'd go to London Fashion Week. Um, I used to sit front row at New Zealand Fashion Week. So my brother lives in New Zealand. So that's why the, the randomness comes in there. And yeah, I really, really enjoyed that. And from there, I, I basically, I didn't really write about lots of mainstream brands. Um, I did work with some of the UK high street brands, but I was all about supporting up and coming designers and showcasing their work and also like different businesses as well. So I ended up um, supporting some local coffee brands and things like that. And from there, they were like, we really love what you do. You're really good on Twitter. Like that's where everything was promoted back in, I don't know, probably 2011, 12. Mm -hmm. And they were like, can you help us with your, with the social media? And I was like, okay. And then I realized that that was uh, something that people needed. So I then uh, opened my own brand strategy and social media consultancy. And this is where I really started to realize my day job was not sustainable at such a high pace. And it wasn't completely fulfilling me. So I asked to go to a four day week so that I could have one day off to be creative. And, um, they gave me that because I literally was like, either I go and that's it, or you can keep hold of me, but I get to have this one day off. So that was amazing. And that was kind of the start of a shift for me. I love that. That It's great that you asked for that. And I think that so many of us look for that creative outlet because our corporate job doesn't give us that. Hmm. But it sounds like your corporation was open to it and recognized that very early on, especially since we're talking about, you know, 2009, 2011, whereas that's what we all want now in 2020. (laughs) I think I probably only went to five day, sorry, four day week, I think 2017. So it'd been like I was working on it. I was slowly building it up. And they started to kind of work out they needed to have social media for their brand and they were trying to do some different things. And actually, it kind of went full circle because the the role that I was doing, I completely had enough of importing. It was far too stressful. And uh, we decided that uh, we wanted to sell some brands in Europe. And so I actually became head of brand and communications for the whole group of companies because all the stuff that I'd learned through my own website and through my own social media, I then bought into the business. So that was really cool because they kind of understood that I had a passion for it. And so why not bring that into the day job? So yeah, it kind of came full circle actually. And then it is the way we came into self-care and writing a book and becoming a coach, did that tie into the fact that you were working so doggone hard in the corporate world? Yeah. So what really happened was I, yeah, like I said, I was working 80 hour weeks. I drank a lot of coffee. My relaxation was to, you know, finish work at seven or 8 PM and then go for a run and come home and probably have a glass of wine with dinner. And I was very just like on all the time. It's very high pace. So it was always about adrenaline and cortisol. And I realized There was nothing relaxing about what I did because I also had my kind of side hustles on the go and I really enjoyed that. But what actually happened, and I realized this is a kind of weird moment, but um, I was actually involved in a car accident 
which uh, I was kind of driven off the road by one of our competitors' trucks, which is really oh my weird. Goodness. Maybe that was a big moment, a big sign. And like, I was fine at the time, but about uh, three months later, I started to have real issues with my shoulder and my neck and I started to get migraines. And um, I probably struggled with these migraines for like seven years now. I still get them occasionally, but they're not as bad. But basically I was having them every three weeks or so. And it was just my level of stress was just too much. And I was maintaining this lifestyle that just didn't work. And I realized something had to give, you know, I had to um, sort myself out before I literally burnt out. And so I kind of see that as now a bit of a warning sign, that car crash of just like, actually, let's stop, let's reassess a little bit. And I started to like, look at the miracle morning from, um, Hal Elrod and, you know, just start doing a few things that helped me maintain a bit more balance. And it was actually through one of my mentors who I met on Instagram she was doing a coaching course and she was like, I think you'd be really good at this. What do you think about this? And one of these weird moments where I was on holiday in the South of France, I think in 2017, and I had an email and the subject line was, so you want to be a coach? And I literally said out loud, yes. And then by the end of that day, I'd like sorted the domain name out. I'd signed up for a course and I was like ready to step into that world. And I realized I just... I wanted to be of service to other people and help them um, through their own journey. I love it. And so you became a business coach before the self-care coach part. Is that right? Yeah, I think um, the self-care part kind of evolved naturally. So I, as you do as a new business owner, I wanted to build my email list. And so I started um, the self-care survival kit, uh, which is now a monthly email. It was weekly, then it became fortnightly. And then for my own self-care, it had to become monthly. It was just too, too much. But I basically share um, a little bit of a editor's letter about what's going on in the world right now. And then two self-care tips, a mantra, um, sort of mindfulness mantra, and then a book recommendation. And it was kind of through that, that I just realized that so many people resonated with what I was talking about. And so many people needed that kind of advice, really. And from there, I took my tips that I was sending out into the ether every month and realizing I wasn't storing them anywhere, that I created a deck of cards so that people could have 52 ways to bring self-care into their life, like at their fingertips at home. So it just really evolved and it became something that I was known for and I just had loads of interest in. That's so creative. I love that. A deck of cards. And I just read your book, Self-Care for All Seasons. And, you know, self-care, I think, is something we're hearing more and more of it. It it didn't really seem to resonate, I think, maybe in the past so much. Mm. You can tell me if you agree with this or not. I mean, I did I did corporate for 18 years, and I don't remember anybody saying anything about self-care until more recently that I've been out of it. Mm. And especially as I became a mom, you know, we all need to take care of ourselves and self-care and, you know, put our oxygen mask on first. And what I love about your book is that you truly take people through each season throughout a year. Mm. How did, can you give me some insight how you came up with this? And, you know, we can talk about some of the tips you share. I I just, I really enjoyed it the way that you can take this book and it's not super long. So Hmm. it's not like you have to, you know, read it, but it makes you think and you can pull it out as we start a new season. Yeah, I want it to become kind of like a reference guide for people to come back to. Um, And one of the reasons it's about the seasons is because, the newsletter that I send out is to a global audience. And I have to be really mindful that, you know, now here in the UK, we're really edging into the end of autumn and starting to get into winter. But um, my best friend that lives in um, New Zealand, she's just started um, spring today, or it's the first day of summer. And so I have to be mindful that my audience is global and that we're not all in the same climatic space. Um, Mm -hmm. And so therefore, you know, if I'm talking about putting a a really cozy sweater on and lighting a candle and getting under a blanket. She's like, I don't want to do that (laughs) right now. Um, (laughs) And so I realized I had all these tips and I wanted to be able to have a, a kind of resource that people could tap into when it worked for them. But the other aspect was not just about the seasons, the four seasons, but also the season of life that we're in and that 
all of my readers are in a different season of life. And again, I have to be mindful, not all of them have kids, not all of them are working in an office. And so when I write the newsletter, I try and be quite generic as well as still quite helpful. But now I've been able to utilize some of those um, tips and just write them in a way that can help guide people through the self-care journey. I love it. And there were some things in there I mentioned before we started recording that I I recognized that I was already starting to do, especially this year, because I've taken time to really slow down. Um, Thanks, COVID. You know, (laughs) I'm now home all the time and and to really make sure that I have that quiet alone time. Mm -hmm. So I start that at five in the morning. But there were also things that I didn't know before, like tapping. Yeah. That was something new. And of course, as I'm reading it, I'm like, oh, I'm going to tap on myself and... (laughs) I definitely felt a calm after I did it. It was definitely something different. And it made me wonder if some of these kinds of motions, if we feel calm afterwards because we've taken our mind off of whatever was going on before. Mm, So it's very much... What I talk about with self-care is very much tapping into the concept of mindfulness and really getting into the present moment and not being attached to, you know, the past or what you've got to do in the next 10 minutes. And it's being in a space where you can just feel calm, centered and grounded in a really kind of non judgmental way. And it's interesting what you said about self-care because I've had this conversation um, on quite a few different podcasts now that people, there's two levels to self-care. Some people don't realize actually they're doing a lot of these things already. And it's almost uh, an awakening to go, well, you are doing loads of self-care. So don't give yourself a hard time thinking you're not um, Mm -hmm. because you're already doing some of these things in your day-to-day life. And um, it's almost like giving them permission to do it, which I don't really like saying, but it gives they they realize that they're already doing it. But the other aspect is, and I think it's quite cultural because here in the UK, I think self-care, people see it as a very physical thing. So going for a run, uh, doing yoga class, uh, doing like a high intensity interval training session. Whereas people I've talked to in the US, they're like, well, self-care is more about getting your nails done, going for a spa day, having your hair done. A bubble bath, right? (laughs) Mm, Exactly. Everyone always says a bubble bath. It's really interesting. (laughs) The bubble bath. Because we don't have them often enough. (laughs) (laughs) So it's, it's uh, what I've tried to do in the book is give I think there's 55 tips across the six chapters, but just try to really say, look, some of even the smallest things are acts of self-care, but it's how we reframe it. And it's how we think of things and go, yes, you know, that is self-care. I'm doing this to benefit me. A bit like what you said about carving out your own, your own time to do these things. That in itself is an element of self-care because you're giving yourself space to unwind and relax and be calm. So it's, it's a really interesting thing that I think a lot of people are talking about it right now, but not everyone fully gets the dimensions of self-care. Yeah, because I think, as you said, it can mean so many different things, you know, and depending on where you are in your life, you know, self-care for me 10 years ago, a bubble bath. Yeah, that was total relaxation. Mm. But now it's like a bubble bath is really for the kids. It's not for me, (laughs) you know, (laughs) but, but taking that quiet moment in time and, you know, I've recently taken back up knitting and, you know, those are ways that I use self-care in my life because it's something that gives me an outlet at the same time. You know, Mm. one thing I was, I was, I want to ask you, like, what does it look like to be a self-care coach? Like, how does that work you know, I, I imagine that somebody is going to come to you because they don't know how to get to that point of relaxing and being present and, and doing these things for themselves. Is, is that the type of person that comes and needs your help in this area? Yeah, I think a lot of the people that I um, coach in particular with self-care, they're usually women and they usually feel a bit stuck in life. So life is really, really busy, but they don't feel like they have a good sense of balance. So my mantra that I have for every single day is that I'm living a balanced and inspired life on my own terms. And I really try and bring in lots of different elements to create that balance. And I think a lot of women just feel like they are, you know, running around a bit like a headless chicken and they they just can't quite work out how to bring, how to kind of bring that down and, and have some level of balance without feeling, you know, the guilt of spending some time on themselves or 
thinking a lot of people think they've, they've got to do like an hour's worth of meditation and half an hour of yoga and all these things. And I think there's a lot of different kind of things on social media about the ideal self-care. But actually what I work out with people is what do they want to do? What resonates with them? A lot of what I talk about with people is, you know, what did you used to do when you were younger that you really enjoyed? Let's get back into that energetic space and um, just go, well, you know, just do breathing for three minutes a day rather than think that you've got to meditate for an hour and then get stressed because you can't fit that in around the kids, you know, dinner time and stuff like that. Um, I talk a lot with people trying to work out their kind of schedule and when is the right time for them to try and bring some of their uh, practices in and how they can build positive, powerful habits that they can maintain and that are sustainable. I I love that because, and it's true what you said about not finding time, because one example I'll use in the book, um, you know, putting your legs up against the wall, that yoga pose. Mm. I had heard about this kind of recently and I was told that, you know, you need to do 20 minutes of this. And so I started to try to do it after I put the kids to bed because I have the bad habit of sitting in the dark hallway until they fall asleep. (laughs) And then I recognized like, well, this isn't working. 20 minutes of sitting here doing this and I can't take my phone with me to do any kind of work because I used to treat that as like work time Mm. as well. Mm. And because every time I'd bring my phone up, the screen would switch because I was lying down. But then in, in your book, you're like, start with five minutes. And if you can do 10, that's great. And I was like, well, I can do five. Like that's not a big deal. And to be able to recognize that chunking it down is better than not doing it at all. Yeah, we often have a sense of overwhelm. And um, I'm not sure if I talk about this in the book, but I definitely talk about it on social media. So I have a lot of books on the side of my bed that are, you know, kind of coaching books and career books and motivation books. And I just keep buying like the next book that's out because I feel like I should, you know, know what's in there. But I never get around to reading them. And I was like, do you know what? Let's bring this back. Let's really unpick it. And um, BJ Fogg talks about this in his book, Tiny Habits, of establishing just really tiny, small habits and then building that bigger if you can, but making it um, a sustainable practice. So now what I do is I have 10 pages of a book a day that I read. And yes, I might actually have time to do 20, but I stop at 10 because that means I'm not entering the space of overwhelm. So I just go, right, let's sit down. Let's read 10 pages. I usually make a few notes as I'm going along. And by making it a small habit, I do it pretty much every day and I can uh, manage it and it doesn't stress me out because it's not fitting in with everything else. And so like you said, it's just bringing things back a little bit. How much can you do? Um, I know someone who's a meditation teacher and her brand is 10 of Zen. Um, and it's all about meditation for mums. And when she was a, a new mum, um, I think it was the second time around, actually, she, that she'd literally be like, I just need 10 minutes to myself. And the kids even got to the point of going, isn't it time for your 10 of Zen? And she'd go off <laughs> and do a meditation. And she just knows that 10 minutes is workable that we can all find 10 minutes in a day. A lot of people say, oh, I don't have time for self-care. And I'm like, oh, but are you sitting there scrolling through Instagram whilst you're watching Netflix? You know, it's it's all about priorities. And that's where it all becomes about what do you want to do and what do you enjoy? Because if you think, oh, I really should do that yoga class that I've seen on YouTube. But if that's just not your thing, you're not going to want to keep doing it. So find the things, like you said, knitting, find the things that resonate with you and that you really enjoy doing and that you want to keep going back to. Absolutely. Yeah. Recently, I've taken back up knitting, more reading. I read every night before bed, but I've been incorporating, especially because of the podcast. I'm like, I'm a, I'm a total cheater like this. I'm all, if I have some authors on, I can take time to read their books and that's considered work. So <laughs> I don't feel guilty that way. <laughs> In reading more than just before bed. (laughs) But yeah, just to find a few minutes and really look at what you love doing. You know, I I think my kids are into it as well. Like I've got them doing a little bit of yoga and I've um, started Mutu. Mm-hmm. the the core workouts. And so my daughter will do them with me. And she's like, isn't it time for your Mutu stomach thing? <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's good to bring your kids into that too, because this then teaches them 
and sets them up to have self-care in their own lives and to recognize Mm -hmm. that they can prioritize themselves because they've watched you do it. Yeah, definitely. I think it's very important for kids to understand that we need that in our life and that it's not all go, go, go. Um, and that it's very important to have that time to unwind, particularly before bed. The other thing is as well about telling the family that you're doing it is accountability. So just exactly like you said, like, isn't it time for you to do this? And then you're a bit like, oh yeah, I probably should do my stomach exercises now. If you're putting it out there and you're saying to people, this is what I'm going to do, they will respect that time, hopefully a bit better and allow you to have that time. But also they will, it's, it's making sure that you, um, fit with achieving it because you've put it out there. So by saying to somebody else, you're going to do it, you're more likely to actually do those things. Absolutely. And you know, it's funny you mentioned that because part of my nighttime thing also is to write in my five minute journal. I write the, you know, what could I have done better today? And last night I'm like, I'm getting towards the end of this. And I read at the front where you have to write down, like, if I do this for five days in a row, then I'll give myself this. If I don't, how will I hold myself accountable? And I put, I'm going to tell my husband that I'm writing in this every day. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So it's absolutely true, you know, to have somebody who's checking in with you and that's why I ha- I work out via Zoom now and the instructor checks in with me, you know, are you doing something? <laughs> I need that. I know that I need that. And I think it's important that you recognize if that is something that you need to make sure that you have that included yeah. in your routine. Yeah, definitely. So where can people start? Where should they start? Obviously by reading your book. Mm. <laughs> but you know what? What's the simplest thing that someone can do right now today to start taking action to incorporate more self-care? I think it's breaking it down a little bit into the three sections, which I talk about at the end of the book, the mind, body, and soul. And it's taking like, what are the physical things that you want to do in order to bring a bit more um, either calmness or healthiness into your life? What are the things that are going to stimulate you and allow you to be creative and um, meet those kind of needs? And then the soul level is really about what are the things that light you up, that energize you, and that are going to make you feel better at the end? And it's having a little brainstorm about those ideas and what um, works for you. So I talk about in the book, you do you. So like I said earlier, like not going for a run, if that's really not your thing and not feeling like you've got to do meditation, just take some time to do a few deep breaths because we can build, you can build up on that over time. And then one of the tools that I share, um, so the, the book has a free workbook alongside it. And I share my weekly wellbeing checklist in there. And this is a concept where you think about all those things that are important to you. I call them your non-negotiables. So all the things you need to be doing in life to make you be feeling, you know, the best ever. And you work out what those things are. So it could be, you know, getting enough, a certain amount of sleep, drinking enough water, taking certain supplements, having a green smoothie, if that's your thing and listing what they are. And then it's literally almost like a kid's gold star you know, um, star chart, you're ticking them off every single day because by seeing you building up that habit, you are more likely to keep going and you see that chain building up. Um, I actually talked about this today in my Tuesday tip on Instagram. You see the kind of connections of what you're doing each day, how you're feeling, and it just keeps you focused and motivated. So it's a good way of starting off and working out what's important to you. That's fantastic. Such a great start. And especially as we wrap up the holiday season and go into the new year. These are great tips that people can start using and to start fresh as we, you know, go into 2021. Mm, Definitely. I think a lot of people have that kind of new year, new you kind of feeling. Yes. Um, I, so this coming year, I'm focusing on joyful January. I feel like we all need a bit more joy in our life. So I'll be running um, some workshops and masterclasses and I'm doing a, a free vision board challenge And I just really want to get people into a better energetic space. So I think starting to think about that now and what resonates with you and what you'd quite like to be doing and just working out, you know, how can you carve that out into your schedule and then take action and see some progress on it as we move into the new year. I love it. And how can people find you, follow you and start this joyful January journey with you? Sure. So mainly I'm on Instagram at Rachel Letham. I'm also on Facebook at Rachel Letham Coach, and um, my book is available at selfcareforthesseasons.com. 
And also my website is rachellethem.com. Perfect. We'll have all that in the show notes so everyone can just click and find you. Thank you so much, Rachel. I really appreciate you coming on today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Friends, as we head into Christmas week, I know there is going to be a mixture of hustle and bustle, along with some sadness for missing the Christmases we are so used to. So I find it extremely important to remind all of you and myself to take some time for ourselves. Take a moment to sit in front of the fire with your tea or glass of wine, snuggle under that warm blanket a bit longer, pick up that knitting project again, take a bubble bath, light a candle, Just do something for yourself and create some moments of peace and calm in your life. Take these moments with you as we start a new year and remember that prioritizing yourself and your needs is a good thing. You deserve this. From me and my family to you and yours, I wish you the merriest of Christmases and can't wait to chat with you next week. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, stay happy, and be good to yourself.